Welcome to The Ross Project, a conversation about life, entrepreneurship, personal development, family tech, and marketing. My name is Ivan Temelkoff, and I'm your host. On this podcast, you will gather 100% real, raw, and unfiltered, life-changing advice to level up in every aspect of your life and business and help you reach your goals and dreams. Today's episode, I have with me Jason Klug, who was born in Wisconsin, moved around the Midwest, and then ended up in Georgia growing up, uh, then on to Salt, Salt Lake City, Utah, went to college for mechanical engineering, and dropped out his senior year. He didn't want to keep taking core classes just for a piece of paper, so he was intrigued by entrepreneurship and product development, moved to Utah, got a gig selling and developing tablet and iPad enclosures. That sounds very exciting. That company sold and, I st and he started Kluganix out of his one bedroom apartment. Full service product development firm at the time has been the core of everything in his career. Now he has a team of designers, engineers, uh, and management in the US and offices in China with project management, PMs, QC managers, and customer support with these resources. Um, They're not only serving customers, but are creating uh, their own brands within like Doral Home. The future is serving uh, more people and companies by helping them develop and manufacture products while starting more brands on the side. Jason wants to build something big and have never deviated from the goals that he has set when he started out his own company. So Jason, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome. It, it's, it, it's Klug, but you, you did, uh, everybody makes that same mistake that you did. So just- <laughs> What's that? Just My last name is Klug, not Klug, but that's all right. You know, you said I, the company <laughs> name right. So I figured you, you got the, the last name wrong, but the company name right. So at least one of them is good. So we're good. okay, yeah. okay. No, that's good to know. I totally suck at names. I mean, that's you know, I have oh, a difficult. Yeah. <laughs> I have a difficult name, difficult first name, last name. I mean, most people can't remember Eastern European names, so I take you know, no, no, no uh, offense to that. So, um, yeah, man, you know, so you've. You know, one of the one of the things that I really liked, you know, about you is just that when I was reading everything about you, you know, there's so much that you've done. So let's just kind of start off. Tell us in a couple of minutes, you know, kind of a little bit about your story. Like, you know, let's go way back to college days, you know, like yeah. how did all this entrepreneurship, building a business thing kind of come about? Let's spend a couple of minutes talking about that. I mean, it, for me, it actually started like even younger as a little kid. You know, I was always all about taking stuff apart, putting it back together, figuring out how things worked, you know? And um, so when I was really young, I was always intrigued by that. And that, that followed me through until, you know, obviously later in life. Um, but in college, I remember sitting in my college orientation and, you know, I just got into whatever school I got into. And thankfully I got into a tech school. Right. And I remember getting orientation. I didn't even know what major I was going to do. I was just like, oh, great. I got into a school because I got denied from every other school. And um, they were announcing, okay, if you're in mechanical engineering program, stay in this room. And, you know, you'll, this is where we'll start that orientation. I'm like, oh, mechanical engineering. That, right. that makes sense to me. That's the stuff I like. I like how stuff is made. So, yeah, that's what got me into mechanical engineering. You know, I went through school. Um, you know, doing odd jobs like I was a go kart repair guy. You know, through mm -hmm. college, I was fixing scooters. Um, I was throwing parties and charging fraternities uh, to throw events for them. You know, so I was had an entrepreneurial thing going there. Um, and then senior year of college, I'm sitting there like I taken most of the engineering classes. All I had left was core classes, and I'm like, I don't this stuff. Right. I was sitting in, like history. I'm like, what the hell? I don't need this stuff right now like, right. I'm, like, I'm sitting here trying to get a, a grade to get a piece of paper on the wall when i already know how to make stuff and making stuff is a way for me to make money i can make products i can sell products i can make money so why do i need a piece of paper on my wall to you know determine my future i don't think that should determine my future right, so right. i basically i was in georgia so basically packed my subaru and i moved to utah at, at that point i dropped out of college packed my subaru moved to utah um, without a job and uh, eventually I found that job at that tablet enclosure company on a sales gig 
and then uh, sold my way into becoming the head of their product development. And, you know, that's what got me professional experience doing it, you know? Sure. So, well, I appreciate you sharing that because, you know, you know, my, my, my thought on, on college and education, you know, is probably significantly different than most people because I am a college dropout. But, you know, in the reality of things is I think the education system is about 20 years behind because, totally. you know, if you want a formal, if you want a career, it's probably formal education that you want to get. You want to be an attorney, you want to be an adopt, a doctor, you probably need to go to school for that because the school right. of hard knocks is not going to help you accomplish that. And I, I have an MBA yeah. in the school of hard knocks, you know, mm -hmm. and so it was interesting that you were talking about when you were sitting in your college orientation, it sounded like you were bored off your mind, you know, cause you already knew like, okay, I know how to make stuff. I know how stuff works. Why am I here? Almost like you're yeah. against your will. Right. So, so let's, let's go back to what you were just talking about. So, okay. You know, you know, as you were going through college, right. At what point you were like, okay, well it's time to, to start my own thing. Like, how did you branch out? Did you look for any kind of investing capital or were you like, Hey, you know, I mean, in college, my only thing was like the side hustle of throwing parties, you know, for that it's free. <laughs> I, I, I made, I made a, a close relationship with the bar that my friends and I would all go to. They had a venue in the back that wasn't available on like Tuesday nights and stuff like that. And, you know, I would just find ways to sell parties, you know, so that, that was a fun little side hustle. You know, and then I had jobs fixing go-karts and stuff. My, my real entrepreneurial kick came when, um, you know, I realized I was going to go 100% on my own was when I was at that tablet enclosure company, right? So I was yeah. there, my, my, the CEO of that company, he's still a mentor and, you know, to me today, you know, this is 10 years later. Um, and, you know, he, he always like, embrace that right you know he knew that i wasn't he was probably going to be my last boss i remember sitting in the first interview with him and saying my goal is that this is the last interview i ever have for a job you know and uh, i worked there for a few years and on the side i was dabbling in and trying to get involved in startups but once i realized that i could make stuff for them and you know they sold that company and they obviously did really well like once I realized that I knew the, you know, how to work with industrial designers, do the actual engineering myself, how to work with manufacturers, onboard them, what was needed to lead a manufacturer, you know, all that stuff. Once I realized I could do that and I realized that I could do that for other people as a service, I didn't need investors, you know, all I needed to do is provide a service and I could charge money up front, you know? So, um, you know, the only thing that the barrier to entry there was I needed uh, the 3D modeling software, a computer and a 3D printer, right? Those things, okay. you know, it's about 15 grand. So to get that money, what I did is I, I pitched Scott at the time, the CEO to invest in me. Right. I was his first investment. Um, he's made many more since then. And um, yeah, I pitched him and then I, you know, basically pitched him to give me, buy me these things so I could start a company and quit his company. Um, but at so, that point he, 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 I was a good salesman, right? So that's always a plus, but he yeah. was, uh, he wasn't opposed to it because he's selling the company and he's like, okay, you could do this, but I need you for three more months. And then once this is all good, <laughs> then, you know, we're good. Just don't tell anybody. We don't want, you know, other people following suit. So, yeah. you know, what's, what is so fucking amazing about that? is that in those kinds of situations, you usually have a conflict of interest, right? Because anytime you leave a company, like, let's face it, you know, management or even the CEO is like, I don't want you to steal my clients. Like they, they almost feel violated. Yeah. They feel offended. And so, but what happened for you was the total opposite. And I think the fact that you were a top salesman or pro was probably advantageous. And well, I, was a, your I was an engineer there. I was an engineer. So I wasn't in sales there. I actually started in sales, but became the head of the product development department. So I was leading engineers, designers, and actually creating the products and mm -hmm. using that ability and my sales skills to work with the sales team to do custom development projects. So we did projects for like Apple, Microsoft, Groupon, you know, so I had a good track record at that company. Right. Um, but after the company sold, there was no reason for him, me to be there anyway. And he knew that. And I wouldn't technically be competing with them because 
I'm developing consumer products. They're making just iPad enclosures, you know? Yeah. I wanted to make everything, you know? Like I didn't, I was bored of just making boxes around tablets that mount on walls, you know? That's, so right, right. he didn't see me as a threat at that point. So that's why I think he did it. So yeah, it worked well, out. Well, you know, the reason I brought that up is this, that conflict of interest is very common in the entrepreneurial community, especially with people when they're first starting out. Let's say, you know, you're leaving a full-time job, which is the most cases for entrepreneurs is that they, they've been working at a job. They know they want to do their own thing and they decide to branch out. And then they face all these repercussions, you know, around just starting a business because it's not always a conflict of interest, but it always almost comes across as, Hey, am I competing directly with my former employer? Most cases you're not. So it was, it was so ironic, but I think that was also an indication of, you know, what was to come ahead for your business, right? What was to happen and the amount of potential that you have, because the way things were playing out, I mean, you've got a former boss that now becomes an investor in your new company on yeah. top of all things, and you were one of his most valuable employees, which let's face it, in most companies, companies don't want to lose their most valuable employees unless they're trying to trim overhead, right? That's the only, the only time that they're going to lose their best employee, of course, if you're a total ass, probably because your attitude, you know, has a lot to do with who you are. And so, okay, from there on, because one thing that I'm getting to here is, you know, in, in your bio, one thing that you mentioned is that you've been through so much pain and struggle to build up your businesses. Oh, yeah. What I want to know from that point on is let's spend a few minutes talking about what was that pain and struggle like? Emotional, financial, you know, like what was going through your head as you're thinking like, holy shit, I'm leaving this job, start my own thing. What's going through your mind at that time? Oh, uh, man, a lot. So... I, I remember, and I was actually with Scott this weekend talking about this exact thing, this exact moment. I remember the last day I walked out of that office, you know, like that final farewell. It was like a Friday. We did Friday lunches. I'm like, all right, I'm leaving early. I'm done. Yeah. I walked out. I, I called my dad on the way home, and I, I just started crying, you know? And which is like, and it was like an overrun of an emotion that I didn't know where they were like, why yeah. I was crying. It was like happiness. It was sadness. It was like, I felt like I learned everything I needed to finally go on my own. I felt like that was the leap and that from then on out, I was never going to look back. And I mean, to this date, I haven't, right. It, you know, when it comes to working or day jobs or any of that stuff, right. um, you know, but that was, that was like a, a good slash you know, just a weird feeling in the best way possible. But, uh, you know, pain and suffering, I mean, that came in waves, all different ways and still does, right? Like it's the pain of being an entrepreneur. It comes down to like financial. There were times that I couldn't pay rent. I had to figure out how to pay rent. You know, I was, um, there was a point when, remember when those hoverboards were popular, yeah, I remember those like little. I was literally buying those in the container, like or buy from China and selling them out of the trunk of my car to pay my salary while I was starting my business on the side, right? <laughs> like, I, I, I mean, there were so many things that I was doing, um, you know, and it eventually got stable. Then you start hiring employees, and then of course you're cutting your own salary, and um, so you could pay everybody before you, you know, right? You know, I hire a top tier engineer. Same thing. Like I was paying the top tier employees that I needed ahead of myself. And there were times that I was like sleeping in a, a room with a bunch of roommates in like some shit house with like a foam pad on the floor. Yeah. You know, my back, literally my back today is still fucked up from it. Like, yeah. just, but you know, and now, now I've got like a good, you know, I've got multiple streams of income and things are good, but there's different types of pain, right? Like now, now it's like, um, you know, some of the stuff, like, for example, I started the other brand that you mentioned, Dry Home, right? That's a line of consumer products that use uh, diatomaceous earth to rapidly dry moisture in your home, you know? Um, I founded that with my fiance, right? So you can imagine, you know, and we're supposed to be married now, but COVID totally screwed up our wedding. We couldn't go to Maui and have our wedding. So we pushed it back and all that. So, um, but yeah. we started a company together. So you can imagine home life. We're fine founding the company together. 
Um, I'm leveraging all of the resources of the brand that I'm relying on for income, Clugonix, to fund that at the beginning. So I'm pushing and pulling from all of my companies and leveraging resources as many ways as I can. And, you know, now that company has become a, you know, sustainable, you know, income that's growing and profitable. But, you know, it just never quits. And the way my brain works is like I, I, I want to do more brands now, even though I know the pain that you go through to create yeah. a brand while I still have this service business that is doing well. And I've got a strong team that I want to make sure is taken care of and all that good stuff. Like, sure. I mean, it's just, yeah, that you know, pain won't go away. One thing that, one thing that you mentioned that, that I wanted to, to, to touch upon. So actually a couple of things is this time, I think there's this huge misconception in the entrepreneurial community that sort of this, that there is this predefined path of how you go from zero to 100, right? And that's complete bullshit, honestly. Yeah. That is complete bullshit. In fact, if there's anything, I, well, one of many things I've learned is that real entrepreneurs such as yourself are probably some of the most humble people on the planet. Like, like you said, I mean, you were sleeping with roommates, you know, in a shit fucking house and you were relentlessly pursuing a dream. Like yeah. most people give up after day one, period. Oh, yeah. I, I know mean, six years too that I did that, you know, so it wasn't like, you know, it wow. short lived I, cause I bootstrapped it. Right. You know? So yeah, that's six years of just staying mentally strong. I mean, you, right. it, anybody go like whenever I have an entrepreneur come to, Clugonics to pitch a product right and want to develop their product with us i mean our services are not cheap right so that's one thing to fact check to make sure they're ready for this sure um, like if sure. they're willing to produce something like they either they got to figure out how to fund it it's not cheap um you know but you know that being said it's like like you also have to look at their emotional character right i like, got are they are they will are they ready for this like are they complaining about, you know, moonlighting it, you know, are they um, balking yeah. at prices of this cost, that cost, the other cost? Are they, um, there's so many layers and things they have to be willing for. And, you know, I've had people that come, you know, we start a project with them and they just, they just can't handle it. You know, it's just like, you have right. to, I'm not going to make your business successful for you by creating this product. You have to make this product, you know, the, the, the business successful. I'm just helping you make one piece of it. There's so yeah. many other things. You need funding, you need to figure out your brand, the quality of your brand and make sure it's like legit and not just some logo, you know, on a website, like all the layers like that, that need to go together to create this. Um, I don't, not a lot of people are, ready for it and they're not re willing to sacrifice so much stuff when it comes to even their personal lives to do it that that's just it you know um one thing that you mentioned before i want to talk a little bit about clogonics you know and and kind of share a little bit more about it but before we do that you know you mentioned emotional you said the word emotional and that really stood out to me because um, I know that emotional intelligence, at least to me, is probably one of the most priceless things that, that I value. I value it in employees. Uh, I value it in just anyone in business, you know, in general, because having strong emotional intelligence, intelligence is probably the best talent that anyone can have, especially oh, yeah. in the entrepreneurial world. Um, and I think too many people just especially right now with this crazy pandemic is too many people are just getting sidetracked, you know, as opposed to really doubling down on who they truly are, because ultimately yeah. long-term that's where you're going to win. Because it's like you said, six years, you're, you're sleeping on a shit mattress and eating ramen noodles in the shit house, you know, mm -hmm. for to chase a dream when most people came the last six fucking minutes to do that. So yeah, Let's talk about Clogonics a little bit because I want to hear more about and I want listeners to hear more about what you guys do and how you help other businesses and entrepreneurs, you know, go from zero to 100. Yeah, I mean, so we have a, a, a it's, it's, it's a full service product development, right? So we help people build physical consumer products. Um, you know, we start with uh, you know, I've got a team of industrial designers, engineers, project managers, uh, and then I've got 
my team in China that my partner Nate runs that office where we actually do the manufacturing, onboarding, supply chain support, quality control, all that stuff. Um, so we really help companies or people, uh, founders come to us with a napkin sketch and could literally take it to the point where we're there reordering production and growing their business. Um, and, you know, so the design process we go through, you know, we do a little bit of research. Uh, you know, we understand the market, we see what's out there, we look and, and try to come up with innovative features and um, start putting pen to paper and do an industrial design process where we create uh, visual product concepts according to what they want to create, you know, whatever that might be. Um, you know, and using process of elimination where we start super broad, presenting a whole variety of concepts with, you know, different forms, function, features, this, that, and the other. And then we whittle them down to a concept that they're stoked on. And then we move them into an engineering where we're creating 3D models and, and um, you know, technical documentation to be able to create a functioning prototype. Uh, you know, that prototype, you know, can be used to do a Kickstarter campaign or to go pitch investors or uh, to test the concept further uh, so they could then continue to refine it. And then we actually then help them refine it through a design for production phase, right? So we even, you know, carry it through, you know, detailed engineering and make sure we're implementing, you know, manufacturing processes and making sure that it's designed for manufacturing processes and get them to the point where they're then able to start working with a manufacturer uh, to produce the product. And because we have our team in China, we transition over there and they actually vet out multiple factories. They pick the factory uh, we're going to work with. We go through tooling making, um, you know, setting up manufacturing, setting up their supply chain, uh, going through those samples till they approve a final sample, and then production run after production run. And, you know, even in the production runs, we're going as far as helping them set up their quality control parameters. And we'll put someone on the ground at the end of a production run to make sure that it stays within the envelope of the quality control standards we set run after run and, you know, help yeah. that product continue to be successful. Yeah. So it's a long process. We work with people for a long time. That's why early on in the process, we have to make sure that we like them and we want to work with them and they have. The sure. balls do it right because, like you said, it's like people get halfway through the process and they they stop, you know, or they um, they they don't they don't realize early on what they're getting themselves into and realize to you don't just put a product on the market and start making millions of dollars. Just sure. the process of getting the yep. product to market is brutal, you know. But we we really help right. make it easy and or at least as easy as it can be. Uh, and educate you throughout the process so you know how to do it once and then multiple times as you grow your brand with more SKUs. So yeah, yeah. Well, so that's, that's actually one of the next questions I wanted to ask you, but I think you kind of talked a little bit about it. So maybe you can elaborate in further detail. And that is, you know, talking about what it what is it? What is it entailing? What does it look like to take a product to market from start to finish? And maybe talk a little bit about, you know, the types of products that you guys you know, bring to market because you're right. I think there's probably a huge misconception understanding what that process looks like. It's probably different for different products. So let's spend a couple of minutes talking about, you know, the different products, the process, what do people need to consider when they're building a product? Yeah. I mean, yeah, we make a whole bunch of different stuff, right? Like uh, baby products, toys, home goods, housewares, um, you know, cut and sew, like outdoor products, stuff like that. Um, but the process, it is slightly different um, depending on the product, you know, when it comes to like later sure. on in the engineering and whatnot. But at the end of the day, our process is, you know, consistent every time, you know, just the things that are different are the outputs when it comes to technical documentation and whatnot. Um, you know, but really it's like a, you know, it's like a four phase process, you know, we ideation is that industrial design, you know, that's where you help, help the customer visualize what we're going to create for them. Right. Um, you know, pen to paper, you know, beautiful sketches, all that good stuff. Um, you know, and then we go to the prototyping. This is where you actually get some physical versions of the product, test it out, um, interact with it, try to refine the user experience and make sure that the way you interact with it solves the problem that you originally set out to solve with this right. product. 
um, you know, going through design for production and refining all those assets and those those uh, tools that are needed to uh, to leave the factory and create the product in production, and then um, and then manufacturing, onboarding, and fulfillment. Right. So, yeah, that that process. It's you know the only things that change. You know, in like engineering. If it's like a plastic product, you know that we're gonna have to three D model with software like SolidWorks. Um, if it's a cut and sew bag or a backpack, you know, we create tech packs or what they call they're like pattern, you know, designs yeah. and measurements and material call outs and stuff. So other than that, it's a pretty consistent, you know, process that flows through our uh, checks and balances till the end. So. Okay. So the question I want to ask you is this, you know, is there any part of this product development that uh, entails in, in the marketing piece or is it just, like, hey, we're, you, you got a new backpack idea and we're just going to help you, you know, like actually build the actual product and then just take it to market. No, I, mean, I think marketing is something you have to keep your eye on from the very beginning. You know, everything down to who you're targeting as a customer, who's your end customer, right? You know, right. is it a very neat market that we're going to target? Um, you know, so visually, are we going to make sure that aesthetically the product is going to target that market? Um, you know, how that target market's going to use this product, right? Um, you know, creating a prototype, is that prototype going to be used for videos and content creation for marketing to get initial interest in the product? You know, if that case, we need to do, you know, a well-finished prototype that visually looks like a final product versus just like kind of a 3D printed one that's for testing internally. Um, sure. you know, getting factories onboarded, we need to figure out price point and what price point is going to work for that market. Are they selling on Amazon? Is it direct to consumer from their own website? Is it going mass retail? You know, those things, all those metrics come into decision making throughout the development process because the unit economics, for example, if you're right. selling a direct to consumer product, you know, usually you have a threshold to sell it at a higher price point, but you have to, right? Because you have the cost of goods, you have right. the customer acquisition cost, you have a lot of times you need to do free shipping or people will fall off of their cart, you know? You have to, um, you know, pay the duties and all that stuff, the taxes on the product, and, you know, all that stuff adds up to where you need to make sure there's enough margin to acquire more customers and buy more inventory and stuff like that. Um, you know, a lot of people that come to us and wanna make a product on Amazon, for example, they, they try to raise to the bottom right at the beginning, you know, and try to get the lowest price point. We have to sell it for $19.99. It's like, okay, are you a volume game or do you want to build something quality that people will use for a long time and remember your brand is a brand they want to purchase more stuff from? Or do you want to make just some crap that they buy and use short time and, you know, goes in the well, garbage? That's an, excellent, that's an excellent point that I actually made when it comes to products is, is that I think most people actually try to get you know, to the top as quickly as possible by building up demand first and foremost, which meaning that usually, like you said, I think most people build a product that's not necessarily a quality product, but something's maybe middle of the road or something very cheap that's very accessible, yeah. especially like you said, Amazon to where people can get hands on it. Like I know I've bought some shit from Amazon. That's like, what the fuck? Give me my money back. You know, it's appealing and people get their hands on it, but that's because they want to build up so demand. But the problem with that is, well, you're going to have more problems long term with a product that is cheap or middle of the road because the quality is missing, right? Yeah. So it's, and, then, and then you have to play the volume game. And the problem with that is you're then, you know, what if you have 10 competitors that hit the same market and are $2 shorter than you and yeah. your sales tank and you can't really achieve those $2 off, right? Like you, you then put yourself in a position where you lose control. Versus me personally, I like direct consumer brands like my Dry Home. We only sell from our website. We have sure. control of all the customers that buy our product. We can communicate with them. We can learn from them about the product, what they liked, what they didn't like. Um, you know, we can, um, you know, retarget them with new products that we launch and stuff like that. Versus like Amazon, you don't, you never interact with your customer other than getting a review, and it's probably going to be a shitty one if you do a bad job. Um, and right. then also like retail, first off, retail gouges you on margin. They push you around. They tell you 
how they want things, what price they're going to sell it at. And if they sell it at that price, you have to sell it everywhere else at that price, even though it's $10 less than you want to sell it on your website. Um, and you know, they could be reordering, 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 and you could be banking on that and have employees that you hire to manage right. that you know, those sales are funny. And then one day they go, sorry, we're done. You know, we, we, your product isn't selling anymore. You're going to buy all these yeah. back. Yeah. So good luck surviving, but you're, we're done with you. So yeah, whatever. No, that's a really good point. Um, you know, that you mentioned and, and I, I appreciate all the insight about the, the product development because I know there's a lot of that happening in the marketplace. And I think a lot of, you know, fresh companies starting out, even some companies that maybe have been in business for a while, struggling really understanding the nuances of product development from start to finish, because there's just so much. And I know this conversation could probably go endlessly because you've shared so much, but you know, in closing, uh, is there anything specific that, you know, you maybe want to share any piece of advice, any insight to other entrepreneurs or uh, anyone else that's in this particular space? And then also, you know, throw out some links on how people can connect with you out there, with you, with your company. Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest thing I think when taking a, a product to market is, you know, strap in for a long process, you know, and like, don't let others, whether it's a retailer, Amazon, a competitor, uh, push you around and, and make a decision uh, around something that's a big, you know, important factor in the business and the future of your business right. when it comes to price points, stuff like that. Um, you know, if you believe in something, stick with it. If you believe there's a market, you know, stick with it and, you know, go from there. Don't, don't let people and companies determine your, you know, wor what direction you're heading um, too soon, you know, get it out there first and then see what the market, uh, you know, does first. And then um, you'll have more control that way when it comes to price point, everything. Um, but yeah, you could find us uh, Klugonix, K-L-U-G-O-N-Y-X. Uh, we're on Instagram, Facebook, you know, you Google us, our website will pull up. Um, and uh, yeah, reach out, shoot us a message. Uh, you can, there's a contact form on our website. You can sign up and we can, uh, you know, we can build out a proposal and walk you through our process in more detail uh, with a free consultation up front and then uh, go from there. Awesome. Jason, thank you so much. You know, it was amazing uh, chatting with you and learning more about your company and your journey. And, you know, you've, congratulations on all your success. I, I think it's, it's well-deserved, especially, you know, talking about the, the challenges, the struggles, the suffering, the risks and the sacrifices. But at the end of the day, isn't that what it's all about? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you having me. This has been great. It's always nice to talk about these kinds of things, which aren't always talked about. So 